you. Some may ask, what is the use of study and prophecy? Again, our topic matter today is the purpose of study and prophecy. Why would we waste time? Why would we take time in studying something like prophecy? Why don't we study things that are going to help us today? The reason for that is because prophecy helps us live a life today. That's, that's the reason, that, that is the reason for it. What is the use of study and prophecy when there's so many differences of, of opinion about it? Why bother in such a controversial subject? Uh, do you think studying prophecy is too speculative? A lot of people find it a very speculative subject. A lot of people say there's no practical value uh, that, is built in, that is built into prophecy. And yet I go back to the book of Revelation chapter 1. Blessed is he who hears and reads the words of this prophecy. If you do not study prophecy, my friends, you are missing a huge blessing from God. It is a huge blessing from God uh, if you begin to look at it. Prophecy will help us in our life today. Uh, many uh, Christians who say these things, it's not that they lack belief in biblical prophecy, but I want you to tell you, I want to tell you what they do. They actually neutralize the Christian theology and some of the belief systems that we have. Because a lot of that is found inside of prophecy. Uh, we've got to begin to look at it and begin to understand what God is saying. The other thing about prophecy, uh, a really good subject matter for studying it, is that it provides hope. Uh, why do we live and do what we have, what, what, what we do today? Why does a Christian live the life that we live today? It's because there's a hope. How do we know there's a hope? Because the Bible's told us about someday there being a heaven. Someday there's going to be a rapture. Someday there's going to be a tribulation and a second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. How do we know that? It's all through prophecy. And so therefore when you begin to say we're not going to study prophecy or just leave it alone, doesn't apply to us today, let's get to some serious stuff. You're missing, number one, a blessing. Number two, uh, you're missing something that can strengthen your hope and your endurance uh, in, your, in, your in your Christian faith. So let's ask the question, number one. Will God really judge this world? Uh, we've studied a little bit of this. We have certainly looked at some of this. In, uh, when we studied our last segment uh, that we studied heaven and hell, uh, I, I would find just as a quick note, uh, I think the pastor's going to be doing something on heaven and hell too, I think, uh, here on Wednesday nights. Uh, don't miss that because uh, it's, it's a tremendous study on the subject of heaven and hell. But as the years passed, individuals in the first century, they began to doubt that Christ would ever return or that God would really judge the sins of the world. Now, this is all the way back in the first century. They had already begun to doubt this thing. Why did they do that? Because the apostles were talking about the coming of Jesus Christ, the soon coming of Jesus Christ. They were truly expecting Christ to come back in their lifetime. They weren't expecting this to happen some 2,000, well, we're 2,012 years out there now. Uh, they weren't expecting this thing to be that far off. They were expecting something in their lifetime. And so they, as, as time, as the first century church began to grow they, uh, and, and expand, they began to lose the teaching that Jesus was coming again, and number two, that God would ever judge, would ever judge this world. If you have your Bibles, open up to 2 Peter, the third chapter. <clears throat> The third chapter in the first seven verses. Second Peter chapter three in the first seven verses. Peter's writing. Peter is writing, obviously, and he says, "This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by the way of remembrance." A very key verse in Second Peter. That you be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, uh, and of the commandments of this apostle, at, uh, of, the, of us the apostles, of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since our fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they are willingly ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was 
being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved for fire against the day of judgment of ungodly men. Do you understand that the world that we are living in today is in reserve for a fire judgment that's going to happen in the future? This world is being reserved for that purpose. Uh, there's a, and we're going to get into why the reservation is happening out there, and it stems out to the fact we're waiting for God, is, God knows their souls to be saved. People say, uh, I think I shared with you in the, in the, in the lesson about hell, uh, there's some that say, I'd rather burn in hell forever than live in heaven with a God who would send people to hell. That's dumb. That doesn't even make any common horse sense. That is dumb for somebody to actually come out and say something like that. Because you've got to understand, because God is going to judge sin does not mean that God does not love the sinner. We mix the two, and the world has mixed the two tremendously. God does love the sinner, and God wants the sinner to be saved. But the fact of the matter is, he also knows that most are not going to be saved, and there is going to come a judgment day when sin will have to be judged, because God is holy and God is pure. I want you to break these verses down very quickly with me. In verse 1, I want you to notice what it says, to stir up your minds by way of remembrance. You are to remember the things that have been said in times old. You are to stir up your mind. That's, a, that's a, a word that means we are to take our minds and work them. There's a lot of people today that are getting really lazy minds. They don't want to work their minds anymore. He says, no, I want you to stir your mind. Think about what you're doing when you cook and stew. What are you doing? You're stirring it up. Why are you doing that? To mix everything together to get it all cooked together. Okay, your mind. You've got to stir your mind and work your mind. He says, by the way of remembrance. Verse 2, mindful of the words of the holy prophets. He specifically addresses one particular area that you are to stir your mind in. And that is to begin to study the holy prophets. And, uh, and, and of the commandments of the apostles and our Lord and Savior. You are to stir your mind with the teachings of the holy prophets. Verse 3. He says, knowing this, that there's going to come in the last days scoffers, walking after what? Their own lusts. The problem we have, folks, in the world today is people are walking and talking by their own lusts. That's a major problem we have today. People, what they're trying to do is trying to figure the Bible out in a humanistic, mindful way. And let me tell you something, folks. You can believe what you want, but I'm going to promise you this. It does not work. The Bible is a spiritual book, and you must understand it by the Spirit of God. To try to understand the Bible in a physical sense, you are walking down a hard, hard path. It cannot be done. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you the deal. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. I could take the book of John, and I could, take the, and I could give it to probably any student at MSU or Ole Miss, or any one of those. And I could say, I want you to read this book, and I want you to write me a report. I know they can do it. I know with all my heart they could, they could read that book, and they could write me a full essay on the book of John, and have it never one time affect their life. If they're not allowing the Spirit of God to work in them as that's going on, that's where the salvation is going to come in, folks. Now, I could give the same book, and I could give it to a holy man of God, and I could have them preach on one verse, John 3, 16. And we could flood that. You can see the flood altars begin to flood. Why? Because the Spirit of God is brought in upon the Word. That is the difference that I'm talking about. People are trying to understand the Bible in a physical sense and not in a spiritual sense, and it simply does not work. We've got to, we, the Bible, uh, we begin to, begin to look at the prophets. It, it will wake us up to the reality of God's glory, it will wake us up to the reality of God's judgment and convict the world of their standing and their sin. That's what we've got to begin to look at when we look at the holy prophets of old. Look at what they're saying here. For since, for since they fell asleep, the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. That's what they're saying today. 
You don't have to look far to that, folks. They're, they're saying that today. All things are the same as they've, as they've always been. You know, we're doing, things are evolving, they're, they're moving forward, and they're making people believe this stuff. The fact of the matter is, things are not the same as they always were from the day of creation. In fact, we are far, far different from what God created in the Garden of Eden. This is not even a glimpse, folks, of what the Garden of Eden is like. God created a perfect world at that time. And then because of one thing, and that was the sin of man, God judged this world. And he judged it by a flood about 4,000 years ago. He judged it by the flood and destroyed the entire world, saving the eight righteous. Now, some people will say, that's a pretty harsh God. No, it's not a harsh God, and it's not that God still didn't love. The, the thing is, God cannot look on sin. And yet today in the 21st century, what we're doing, folks, is we're winking at sin. We're looking at sin. And we're beginning to get this, this theology and this idea that, well, we have black sins, white sins, and gray sins. Now, not every sin is exactly the same out there. And I'm, I, I'm telling you, folks, that's we're, we're building into this, and it doesn't work. God looks at sin as sin. And it doesn't matter what the sin is. Sin will separate you from God. And God will judge sin. Now, I understand for the Christians out there that uh, we have grace that is built into this thing uh, for the Christians. Uh, there, therefore, you don't have to uh, live on your knees repenting every, every time something goes wrong because God is looking at the heart. Uh, we're not getting into that, all of that today. I want to stay with this idea of prophecy. Is God really going to judge this world? You bet He's going to judge this world. You bet it's going to happen. The day is coming. There's an appointed day when God will judge us, will, will judge uh, this earth. According to 2 Peter in the third verse, he says, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts. If you don't see it, my friends, look around you. We're living in the day. I heard something, somebody called us this morning about uh, big news. Big, big news out there today. This, 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 this is national news, folks that the Presbyterian Church just appointed their first gay uh, priest, or pastor, whatever they call it. I think they call it pastors in the Presbyterian Church. That made, that made headline news. But yet, somebody getting saved yesterday, nobody heard about. But we heard about the, we heard about the other things. In the last days will be scoffers against the word of the living God, and scoffing against creation. If you want to know more about creation, about what uh, this the verse here is talking about, <clears throat> get with us an another time, and we'll certainly talk about that. Why do non-Christians attempt to discredit the reality of the final judgment? The fact is, folks, people want everything to be okay. They don't, they don't only want it to be okay now, they want it to be okay for all of eternity. People do not want to accept the fact that things can go wrong. When things do go wrong, Many people fight it. Many people have problems with it. The fact of the matter is people want everything to be okay, both now and in the future. And yet eternity, can you all admit with me that eternity is rather a mystery? You know, yeah, we know about what's going to happen out there. We know how it's out there. But I'll be honest with you, we got no idea really what it is. Well, we gauge everything by a clock. That clock runs 60 seconds, 60 minutes to an hour, uh, 24 of them in a day. We run, but we run by a clock. Eternity is outside of the clock. There is no time in eternity. <clears throat> eternity is outside the realms of time. And so therefore, when you enter into eternity, you're simply there. That, 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 that's all there is to it. You, you just, you're just there. And it never goes away. It, 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 never, it never ends. It, it never, uh, never really starts, I guess, but once, once you enter into it. But it, never, it certainly never, ever ends. People want everything to be okay. Eternity is a mystery, and so what people begin to do is they try to assume that that mystery of eternity is all going to be good. Everything is going to be okay. The, I, think about it for just a second. When we were studying hell, the thought of people going there and being like that with no escape. You can't get out. You're, you're just there, and it never ends. Now, you, you can probably imagine, that, that's a mind-boggling thought. That's, that, that, is, that is a horrid thought to think of something like that. So what they do is they simply suppress the teaching of hell, which is what we're finding today. 
a suppression of the teaching of hell. And what we're doing is people are not realizing that there is a hell to be shunned. People, are, don't, people do not even realize it anymore. In the church today, we're finding less and less talk about this place called hell. I think I shared with you all a while back that um, the, the idea of uh, hell and the devil now, there's teaching out there that they are actually simply symbols of all that is evil. They've even gone to the point now with the Holy Ghost. And they say that the Holy Ghost is not real. The Holy Ghost is only a symbol of all that is good. So what they've done is they've taken reality of the Bible and they've turned it into symbolicism. And therefore, if it's simply a symbol, what is there to fear? It's goofy. It really is. But what does it say? In the last day, there'll be scoffers. People are going to make fun of the Word of God. A great deal of the religious world is full of prejudice against what the Bible teaches about hell, and what the Bible teaches about judgment. Some of them even sacrifice a belief in heaven and a new Jerusalem in order to excuse their rejection of the biblical warnings concerning hell. Others sacrifice the biblical view of God's holiness in order to teach a weak and a watered-down view of his, of his love. And let me tell you something, folks. I think you've heard even from the pulpits here at this church here, what they've preached some, that has been addressed here. That there's a watered-down word that is beginning to explore the church right now. And many people are getting very, very happy with it. Acts 17.31, if you get a chance to look at that, uh, Paul's statement concerning the certainty of judgment. Let me tell you something. There is a specific day that has been appointed for judgment. If you look at Acts 17.31 and read it, there's a specific day which has been appointed for judgment. Now I want you to understand something. That day will not change. That day has been appointed. And that day is not, good, is, is, not going, is not going to change. All men are given the assurance that Jesus Christ died. All men are given the assurance that Jesus rose again. The fact of the matter is, you can believe it or you don't believe it, but the historical records say there was a man named Jesus Christ on this earth. You cannot dispute it. The fact of the matter is, that man died on a cross. You cannot dispute it. It's a historical record. It happened. And the fact of the matter is, they went and looked at that grave three days later, and he was gone. Okay? You can't dispute it. It's a historical fact. The question is that the world and the church is answering differently is who was this man, Jesus Christ? The fact of the matter, he was God incarnate in the flesh. He came to earth and he died for our sins. Judgment, remember this, my friends, is not a lack of love because it's simply a fact that God cannot look on sin. That's all it is. God loves, the, God loves everybody in the world that's committing sin against his word. He still loves them. But he's going to judge that sin. And if you live a life of sin, if you live a life that is outside the word of God, understand, you will be judged for your sin. Understand that. Will God judge this world? Yes, God will judge this world. And he will judge the sin of this world. Let's go to the next question. Will Jesus Christ really return? This is definitely an age-old question. Will Jesus really return? Only one generation after the Lord had, uh, uh, ascended up into heaven and the angels gave the promise of his return, the apparent delay in his coming bothered some Christians. We shouldn't be surprised that after 2,000 years, people are still saying, when's he coming? Is he really coming? I mean, come on, folks. Okay, they said he was coming. We've been waiting 2,000 years. Is this event really going to happen? Will Jesus Christ really return. 2 Peter 3 and 8, if you go down just a couple verses uh, down there, um, he says that, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. Many people have associated this verse with a lot of things. Um, in this particular segment, he's talking about uh, the created world, and so people say, hmm, if every day is a thousand years, a thousand years is a day, that means creation would have taken 6,000 years to create this world. <clears throat> this verse has nothing to do with creation. Okay, this verse is trying to give you a panorama view 
something you can put your arms around a little bit. It's a panorama view of eternity. That a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. And then the next verse says, the Lord is not slack concerning His promise. Many people out there are saying that God is slack concerning His promise. God is delaying the promise of the coming of His Son. No, God is not delaying it. Let's take a look at the calendar, if you will, in a heavenly sense, in an eternal sense. If a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day, how many days has it been since Jesus died on the cross? Two. So is God slack in His promise? It's only been two days in a heavenly calendar. If you want to get down to what I'm just I'm telling you what, what the word's saying here, okay? It's only been a couple days. You know, your day and my day is not the same day as God's day. So for God, is he slacking his promise? Absolutely not. He's only been gone a couple days. You no, know, give, give, give him another, you know, give another day or two. You know, give, 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 give some time for his appointed time to take effect. There's a lot of other things that are built into there that really uh, it has somewhat to do with prophecy, but not, but it doesn't have to do, to do with the return of Jesus, so I'm not going to run that rabbit down. I said I'm going to try to follow this guideline, <laughs> so I'm going I'm to try not to chase a lot of rabbits. It's only natural to be curious about the exact timing of Jesus Christ. Thousands of books, thousands of articles, thousands of sermons have been written on the subject, when is Jesus Christ coming back? There are people who have ran mathematical calculations. There are people that have assigned numbers inside the Bible. And if you add this and you add that, oh man, how many people in the last hundred years have equaled the number of the Antichrist? I mean, they're all over the place, okay? We've had more Antichrist living and yet they're all wrong because he hasn't showed up yet. People don't understand the way things are really going to work. We've got to, um, let, me, uh, let me assure you of this. We've got to stop trying to figure out when Jesus is coming back. Now that may go against some of your theologies, I don't know. We've got to stop trying to figure out when Jesus is coming back. And what we've got to do, because let me tell you, we cannot, we cannot understand the timetable of God. We cannot understand the eternal timetable of what God is doing out there. We're living a life that is enveloped and emboxed in a timetable down here on the earth. We're in the 40 years of the wilderness down here. That's what we're living right now. And all we're trying to do is make ourselves worthy to get into the Canaan land. That's what we're trying to do. So we're living inside of this clock. We've got to stop trying to understand God's eternal timetable. In God's knowledge and in His power, He's going to come when the time is right. You know what we've got to do? We've got to be ready. That's, all, that's what we've got to do, folks. We've got to stop spending so much time trying to figure out when Jesus Christ is coming back to this earth to rapture his bride out of this earth. We've got to stop spending that time and spend that time trying to figure out what we need to be doing to be ready when he does show up. Understand what I'm saying? We've got to flip-flop our studies. That's what we've got to do. Flip-flop the studies and begin to study what's, what really, really is important. Now, is it important to understand that Jesus is coming back? I think so. I think it's vitally important to understand that. But is it vitally important for me to know that he's coming back tomorrow, next week, or in the next century? Not really. What is important for me to understand is what I need to be doing in this life to be ready if he does show up this afternoon. And that is where we're losing our theology. We're losing our spectrum. We're losing our scope on what's important. We're too, we're too enveloped with the riffraff around the edges and we're not getting down into the meat of what, what we need to be studying. So the fact of Jesus is coming back, that is vitally important. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. <coughs> it explains why expending a great deal of energy in determining the, to determining the exact time of Christ's return is very, very inappropriate. Let's see if I can pull that, pull that up real quick here for you. Acts 1 and 8 says, But you shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea 
and in all Samaria, and under the uttermost parts of the earth. You shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost shall come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me, both in Columbus, in America, and in Africa. Okay, now I just changed some countries a little bit right here, but that's what he's talking about. Locally, nationally, and worldwide. We are going to be witnesses. How are we, how, how are we going to be witnesses? By the power which is, which is enveloped upon us by the Holy Ghost, which is going to be sent from God upon these people and upon you and I. So that becomes a, a vital area of study and what we need to be truly focusing on what we're doing. <coughs> We've got to rely on God's power. We've got to rely on the Holy Ghost to embrace what God has called us to do. If you want us, if you want to concern yourself with what you need to be doing every day of the week, study Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore into all the world. Teach the gospel, baptizing them. So what do we got to do? We have a twofold ministry, right? Go into all the world, go into Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, go into Columbus, America, and Africa, and we got to do two things. We got to teach them, and we got to baptize them. That ain't me. You may disagree with that, but if you do, uh, go read 28, 19 again. We got to do two things. We got to go, we got to teach them, we got to baptize them. Okay, that's what we got to do. Uh, teach them so they get saved. That, 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 is, that is the critical part of that whole thing. According to James, let's jump over to James real quick. Uh, James chapter 5. <coughs> James chapter 5, verses 7 to 11. I want you to look at some things here uh, concerning, uh, concerning this, this concept of what we're talking about. Will Jesus return again and the patience type thing? He says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, undo the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman, the husbandman waiteth for the, pre the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he receive the early and the latter rain. Be also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord, for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy and will endure. We have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, the Lord is very pitiful of tender mercy. He gives you a glimpse here of what you need to be doing. Number one, I like to break verses down. Number one, God is patient for the lost and for the lost and for the saved. God has patience with you. You may not, you may not like what I'm about to say, but I'm going to tell you something. It's good that God has patience with you. That knocks you down a step, that's okay. It's good that God has patience with you. It's good that God has patience with me. Praise God that he has patience with me. Okay? He says, he says here that God is patient, waiting for the last of the saved to come in. Verse 8, he says, we grow in patience. We establish ourselves in the word. We've got to grow in faith. We did uh, last Wednesday night, we talked about faith uh, here, here at the church. You got to grow in faith, folks. Don't let your faith sit around and slumber. The Bible says we need faith as a grain of mustard seed, and if we did, we could move mighty mountains. I don't know many people who move no mountains lately. Okay, now faith, somebody brought me a mustard seed one time. It was cool. Except for when he put it on my hand, it, it like it disappeared. It was so small. I ain't never seen a seed that small. I promise you I've never seen a seed that small. But yet he says, that's how big our faith has got to be. And if it is, we can move mighty mountains. So the question is, how big really? How big really is your faith? We've got to grow in faith, my friends. This is a huge, huge subject to study faith. We've got to grow in patience. Verse 8, we've got to establish ourselves in the Word. Verse 9, we've got to learn to bear no grudges. If you've got grudges in your life, 
you need to get down to an altar somewhere and you need to ask God and repent of your sins. He says, you are to bear no grudges. You know, verse, uh, verse 10, he says, be ready. He says, to suffer and be ready for the affliction. The fact of the matter is, it's going to happen. I think we're going to see some suffering and affliction. I'm not talking about the things we're seeing today, folks. This ain't suffering and affliction. Okay, you ain't seen nothing yet. You ain't seen nothing yet. If you want to know what suffering and affliction is, go overseas. You'll find out what suffering and affliction is. They're getting, they're getting killed over there for their faith. You say suffering and affliction. Are we not seeing that in the African children and the Haiti children? Are we, gonna... Are we not seeing it in the children and African Haiti? That's what I mean. Across, across, I'm, I'm supposed to say across the nations, we are seeing Not in America. We're not, we're, we, we as people here in America, we're not seeing a suffering and affliction. If you think we're seeing suffering and affliction, I'm telling you something, you're in for a big shock. Because I think we're going to experience it before, before the rapture of Jesus Christ. I think we're going to see some of it. But if you want to see it, you need to go look overseas. Because I'm telling you, they're being killed over there. I got a couple uh, pastors that I talk to uh, uh, through, through Skype. And we, we do some communication with one another. Uh, some in Pakistan, India. I've got some in China. And, and, we, and we talk back and forth about things that are going on, going on in the world back there. And they're like, you know, in our, in our village... We had to leave our village and go out into the jungles. We had to stay there for almost eight days because they were coming in to kill us. They burned our churches. They burned our houses, burned the whole thing down. And then we were allowed to come back in, and we had to rebuild it again, only to know that they're going to come back and they're going to burn it again. They rebuild knowing it's going to get destroyed again. That's affliction. That's affliction. That's suffering. How many of us would be willing to go through all, all of that? But I promise you, my friends, you had better be willing to go. But Jesus Christ, he is patient. Even knowing all this is going on, Jesus is patient, waiting for his return. Because you know why, folks? He wants one more drunk to be saved. He wants one more prostitute to be pulled off the street. He wants one more drug addict to be brought into the kingdom of God Almighty. We got to stop with our views of different things in the world and begin to see them as Christ sees them. We really do. Will Jesus Christ return again? Absolutely. Is he being patient in that return? Absolutely. And praise God for his patience. But because he has such patience and because you and I are commanded to be like Jesus Christ, you and I are also commanded to have patience. Notice in these verses in James. Verses 7 through 11, in four verses, you see patience mentioned four different times. When I see something like that in the Bible, I begin to look at it and say, that's important. Okay? He keeps talking about it. That's important. So, will God really judge the world? Yes, God will judge the world. It's going to be, uh, it's going to be a, horrific, a horrific judgment in the time of the seven-year tribulation. Will Jesus Christ really return? Absolutely. Is, it going to, is he going to return on my schedule? Absolutely not. Is he going to come on your schedule? Absolutely not. He has got an appointed time. And we've got different things in the Bible that show us these things. Now, the crucifixion is one of the things to look at. That was an appointed time, a time and an appointed hour that he gave up the ghost. And nothing can change that. Nothing can, the devil tried to change it, if you remember right with the whippings, with all the things that went on. He tried to change it, but he couldn't. Will Jesus come again? Absolutely. But be patient. Be patient. Show yourself approved. Walk by the ways of the Lord Jesus Christ. Walk by what he has commanded you to walk in, so that on that day you are ready for the rapture of the bride. Many are teaching today that the uh, the, the church is going to the rapture. And we're going to get into the rapture actually in the study. We're going to study it. But you're saying, oh, when the rapture comes, you know, the church is going to go away. I'm like, nah, you're kidding yourself. Now, the church is going to be here just like it is today. The bride is the ones that are going. The bride of Jesus Christ. His church is going to be gone. The bride is leaving. Not necessarily the church. Does the Bible reveal... Uh, does the Bible prophecy reveal that everything will happen? As we begin to study why is it, why is it important to study prophecy, 
I think we've got to look at the judgment. We have to look at the, is Jesus coming again? Does the Bible reveal everything that will happen? No, absolutely not. Um, we see in the Bible, in the Old Testament, all the prophecies concerning when Jesus Christ was going to be born. Every prophecy about the birth of Jesus Christ came to pass. But Jesus did things throughout his life that were not prophesied. And that's something to understand when you're looking at Revelation and you're looking at prophecy. Understand this, everything that has been prophesied will happen. But are there going to be events that are going to happen that have not been prophesied? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Don't think that you just got a big picture here and God says, well, this is what I wrote, this is all I can do. No, what he's doing, he's letting you know what is going to happen. But we don't have to know everything. And I'll give you an example of that in just a second. We, in fact, are a very impatient people. And have you ever noticed that we tend to evaluate ourselves sometimes according to our standards? I think I got a lot of patience. Well, that's good for you. Good for you. What does God think about your patience? Are you as patient as God? That's what we got. We got to begin to look, we got to begin to look at these things, folks. Stop evaluating ourselves according to what we think is right. Because you know what happens then? We start evaluating other people according to how we think. And that's a big problem we got in this world. We don't evaluate things according to the Bible. We evaluate them according to our standards. Let me tell you something, America. That's a problem we got here in our society. We evaluate the rest of the world according to our standards. You, you think I'd read the, just listen to the news if you want to. Cool. But that, that, that's turned into a joke. But if you want to look at the news, take a look at the news, okay? And watch how we evaluate everybody else in the world. They are judged and they're evaluated according to American standards. Now, I got a question. Who said we were right? Because I'm going to tell you something. This nation has turned in to a almost atheistic nation. We, are, we have turned into a nation that is so far from God that we don't know what end is up. And in many cases, the church is not big enough, brave enough, or bad enough to stand up and do something about it. They're simply going along with the flow. And that is too bad. That really is too bad. We are living in the end times, folks. We are living in the end times. Uh, we've got to begin to uh, handle things the way God would have us to handle them. Let's judge ourselves by God's standard. Let's get back to this. Uh, the reason I say what I'm saying is, in Revelation chapter 10, uh, remember they heard a voice from heaven that and he would not permit him to write what was in there. He talked about the seven seals, he talks about the seven trumpets, and he talks about the seven vials. Okay? Sequential events that will happen during the time of the tribulation. Okay? I think that's pretty well okay. It's written. It's got to be okay. But then between them, between the trumpets and the vials, he wrote about the seven thunders. And he said, and he talks about the seven thunders, and John, he's doing what he's supposed to do. He gets the pen out. He's getting to write out what the seven thunders say, and God says, stop. He says, write not the things that you've heard in the seven thunders. I think John took him up and ate him, or did, 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 it was Daniel that did the eating. But he took some, he takes him up, he eats these things here and down, and we don't know what they are. I've, I've seen people spend books and time and hours trying to figure out what the seven thunders are. You ain't going to know what the seven thunders are, I don't believe. There are a mystery that's going to happen in that time. Okay, just accept this. There will be seven thunders. Because God said there's going to be. There are going to be things happen during that time that have not been written in the Word of God. We simply don't need to know. Do they feel they have a higher seat than Jesus? Some of the people that say uh, out, out there that they've discovered the date and time. How many of y'all ever heard somebody who's discovered the date and time that Jesus is coming back? They're out, they're, they're out and about, man. They're, they're, they're all over the place. Oh, we've done figuring it out. Man. Well, let me ask you this. Do they have a seat higher than the seat of Jesus? Because the Bible says Jesus don't even know, but the Father only. So for you to say that you have figured out the date and the time that Jesus is coming back, you have actually taken a higher seat than Jesus Christ. Somehow, let me tell you what, you're one qualified person. Okay? The fact of the matter is, they're ignorant of the facts. Why did God reveal it to them? 
I ask him sometimes, why did God reveal it to you and not to Jesus? I mean, man, who are you? But they have. They put themselves. Why has Jesus taken so long? As we, as we, begin, as we finish, finish this part of it up, why is Jesus taking so long? The fact is that men's knowledge measures slackness. If you look at 2 Peter again and look at the ninth verse. 2 Peter chapter 3 and the ninth verse. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, perish, but that all should come to repentance. God has got a call to repentance, folks. It is happening in our world today. It has been happening for the last two thousand years. God is not slack concerning his come concerning his coming, but the fact of the matter is God is having a call to repentance. I think we're going to see somewhat of a revival that's going to begin to break out. I think some of the major revival may break out shortly after the tribulation. But I think we're going to see some of that begin to break out before, before, uh, before the rapture happens. I believe, obviously, that the rapture is going to happen before the tribulation. Uh, but I don't know that either. I, I, I believe that by, by what I read in the Bible. Uh, I, I asked somebody one time, uh, I was talking to a, a gentleman that I respected very highly in the Word. Uh, so what do, you, what, what do you think? I mean, you're pre-trib, I'm pre-trib, but what do you really think about mid-trib? What if, what if Jesus comes in the middle? Or uh, what about the verses that point to maybe he'll come at the end of the tribulation? And we talked for a couple hours, going back and forth about different things. And finally, he finally looked at me and says, you know, you can keep this little nugget of knowledge. He says, it don't really matter when he comes. He says, I do know this. Number one, I got to be ready. And number two, he says, no matter when he comes, he will see me through. So if he comes at the beginning... I say praise the Lord. If he comes in the middle, I say praise the Lord. And if actually we have to live through it and it comes at the end, then I still say praise the Lord. Because the Bible says that his strength and his endurance is going to see me through all the way to the end of that thing. Uh, again, I, I, I think that I think it's definitely pre-trib is, is definitely the way, the way what the Bible's teaching us uh, for a lot of different reasons. But the fact is, will Jesus come? Absolutely. Uh, there are people that believe there is no coming of Jesus. Uh, I was called, uh, <laughs> I, got, I got involved uh, helping somebody out with a, with a internet thing they got, chat thing, uh, what do you call them, uh, blog type things. And they have a internet ministry going, so I was, uh, they, they, they called me and asked me to help them out with a question that was coming up. And so I got on there and got to talking and uh, the, this lady was talking about the fact that there is no, rap there is no rapture. That, that is false teaching. So I explained a couple things on there. And uh, next day I went back and reviewed everything. And holy cow, man, I was called a false prophet. I was called uh, a devil worshiper. I, 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 was called every, I, I was called everything that you could think of, man. From, from, if it involved a devil, I was there. And the only thing that she was writing about was the fact that I believed that there was a rapture at all. If you believe in a rapture, then you are of the devil. I said, man, alive, it's a, it's a teaching. You know, relax. <laughs> it's a te if there ain't no rapture and it happens at the end of the tribulation, I'm still, God's still going to see me through. You know, this isn't a question of salvation. It's a question of rapture. But there are people that are that dogmatic about this rapture thing. Okay? Again, they're spending too much time on it. They're spending too much time on it and not concentrating on what we need to be doing to get ready for the rapture. The question is, are you ready? We have to have, I'm going to finish up with this. God's having a, God is not slack concerning this whole thing. It is a call unto repentance. And there's an encouragement for holy living. You, my friends, are commanded to live a holy life. I think it's in the 11th verse of this thing here. Um, Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. Everything is going to be dissolved. What manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? If anybody ever tells you that you cannot be holy, they are lying to you. If anybody ever tells you that you cannot be godly, they are lying to you. Because God has commanded us to be holy 
and to be godly in everything we do and in everything we say. So the question is, why do we study, why do we study um, prophecy at all? That's, that's the real question here. Why do we study prophecy at all? The hope of Jesus' coming should influence all aspects of your Christian life. Bible prophecy should help keep the Christian's eyes focused on the goal for eternal life. God has promised it. You need to look at it. You need to understand it. And then, my friends, you need to live a life here on the earth that is going to help you to achieve it. That's the beauty of studying prophecy. That's the importance of knowing what it is. When it is, is not that important. What it is and the fact that it is real is very important. So we're going to dig into a lot of different aspects. We're going to look at Israel. We're going to look at the Jews. We're going to look at a lot of different things over the course uh, of the next few weeks. Uh, we're going to look at, uh, next week, look at interpreting bio, uh, biblical prophecy. If you would, please uh, take some time this week and fill out your books. Uh, to take a look at these things, understand what your opinions are. Uh, you can see I've scribbled all over mine. Look, look at the notes all over the place. Scribble on it, okay? So that if you got something to say or you got a question, we can address it. I really want to, I really want to do that. I pray God's blessings upon you. Look at this week. Look at chapter 2. Read it. Fill it out. Let's come back next week. Let's understand how to interpret prophecy and why it is important to understand how to do it. That may be more important. God bless you. Praise you. Go into church, my friends. I'm praying for a glorious service. Uh, prepare your heart before you go in. Prepare your heart before we start singing. In Jesus' name.